Has this ever happened to you? Today I would watch a scene from my favorite television series, Breaking Bad. Wow, what a great scene. I wonder what the comments have to say. I'm just scroll down and take a look. And that's when you saw it. <laughs> this is the moment Walt becomes Heisenberg is one of the most overused sentences by people who want to sound sophisticated. The line is so overused that it's become one of the most infamous jokes pertaining to the fandom. Try watching Breaking Bad with someone and they'll probably point out the exact moment to you that Walt becomes Heisenberg. Now, to be fair, every piece of media has that one thing that people will try to point out to their friends in an effort to sound smart. Hey. Did you know that Neo from the Matrix is actually a metaphor for Jesus? Look at this shot. This is a subtle reference to Jesus. But usually, once the moment passes, you can go back to watching it in peace. But this whole debacle about when Walt becomes Heisenberg doesn't even make sense to me because we all already know that Walt dies in season one, episode six, when he commits suicide with the shaver. And then in the next scene, we see this bald guy walk out and we follow him around for the rest of the show. The problem with the whole, this is the exact moment Walt becomes Heisenberg thing is that there is no one moment that Walt definitively breaks bad. There are a plethora of moments that could be argued as tipping points, but picking just one is almost impossible. Thus, almost every video on YouTube that showcases Walter doing something even slightly devious is littered with comments about this being the moment. You could post the clip of him falling on his ass while trying to swat a fly, and someone would declare it the moment. So, once and for all, how about we settle this? What is the exact moment Walter becomes Heisenberg in Breaking Bad? And does such a moment even exist? Well. To figure this out, we're going to have to define precisely who Heisenberg is and what separates him from Walter Look anywhere on the internet and you'll see that the main hook behind Breaking Bad is that a man who is truly good, a good father, a good husband, a good teacher, etc., becomes corrupted by power and ego until he becomes bad. He becomes so evil, in fact, that he takes a German name. Within the broad strokes of the story, Heisenberg is an alias Walt adopts to protect his identity. He gets the name from Werner Heisenberg, a German theoretical physicist famed for his discovery of the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle dictates the more accurately you know a particle's velocity, the less accurately you'll know its position in space, and vice versa. Or in other words, the more you know about one side of an equation, the less you know about the other. So, um, on that note, Walter White. Walter represents a man who, despite his virtue, has been rejected by the world around him, whereas Heisenberg represents a man who has himself rejected the world around him and forged his own path. Where Walt is insecure, Heisenberg is ruthless and sociopathic. Where Walt is timid, Heisenberg is ambitious. A large portion of the show examines the dichotomy and internal struggles between these two sides of Walter's persona. So we have a show about a man diagnosed with cancer who turns to cooking crystal meth to leave money behind for his family before he dies. So, well organized. Hank, how much money is that? Uh, it's about 700 grand. Well, I'll just say the word and uh, I'll take you on a ride along. Get a little excitement in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Something. When does this plan stop being justifiable? Uh, is it ever justifiable? Well, whether or not you believe that it's justified for Walt to start producing highly addictive drugs after finding out he won't be able to afford his cancer treatment is irrelevant. The relevant question here isn't when did Walt become a criminal, but rather when does Walt become Heisenberg. Remember, there are plenty of criminals who are known to have broken the law, yes, but for a noble cause. I'm talking about the real-life Robin Hoods of history. Sure, Edward Snowden is a criminal under US law, but I don't think you'd see many people calling for his head considering what he did. Snowden said he saw firsthand and became increasingly concerned about the reach of the NSA's electronic surveillance of innocent Americans. Conversely, there are plenty of billionaires who made their riches through the pharmaceutical industry legally by overpricing drugs that people need to survive. I think Mike said it best. I've known good criminals and bad cops, bad priests, honorable thieves. You can be on 
one side of the law or the other. But if you make a deal with somebody, you keep your word. So, considering that Walter legally becomes a violent criminal in the pilot, does that mean that he turns from a good man into a piece of shit right off the bat? If I'm being entirely honest, it doesn't seem like it. Sure, he kills a man, but to be fair, the man he killed was a murderous psychopath pointing a gun to his head, so I think I can chalk that one up to self-defense. Also, do keep in mind that cooking meth was just a backup plan after the whole popcorners thing didn't work out. We've got six signature flavors, y'all. Seven! You make seven! Seven. Seven works. Ostensibly, Walter is the same depressed, beaten down man after cooking his first batch as he was before. We can see this plainly in how much pain it causes Walter to kill Crazy Eight, a choice he figures he has to make to keep his family safe. I'm so sorry. So, let's jump forward. Logically, the next place it would make sense to look would be the first time he refers to himself by that name, which comes in Season 1, Episode 6, when confronting Tuco Salamaca. What's your name? Heisenberg. Heisenberg. What can be said about Walter in this scene specifically? Well, this is the first scene in the entire show when he displays true confidence. Tell me what you want. $50,000. <laughs> There are fleeting moments of confidence before this, but it's here that we get our first glimmer of Walt being truly reckless. Are you fucking nuts? You wanna find out? And yet, his plan works. He frightens Tuco into paying him what he's owed, and then he jerks off in his car. Oh, uh, by the way, there's a meme hidden in this scene? Some madman editor stuck an audio clip of Howard Dean's infamous into the background of this scene. Don't believe me? Now, this could, of course, just be an Easter egg. But what if it's not? What if it's actually a metaphor? I mean, think about it. The scream marked the end of Howard Dean's career in politics, and maybe by inserting this sound effect, Vince was trying to tell us that this is where Walter's career ends, because it's where Heisenberg's career begins. Bravo, Vince. By all means, this scene seems to be the first appearance of Heisenberg. And going off what we see here, Heisenberg seems to be prideful, confident, ballsy, and dangerous. He also seems to only emerge when Walt is back into a corner. So, is that it? Does Walt become Heisenberg here? Case closed? Well, remember, we're not looking for the first appearance of Heisenberg, but rather the moment that Walter supposedly becomes Heisenberg permanently. The event horizon of Heisenberg, if you will. And I don't think many people who've seen the whole show would be convinced that this is it. Come on, he hadn't even started wearing the trademark fedora yet. We see numerous times after this that Walt still holds on to a sense of morals. There's an entire stretch in season three when he tries to give up cooking meth out of guilt. And, um, a desire for Skylar to take him back. Okay, mostly just so Skylar would take him back. But either way, you wouldn't call this version of Walt Heisenberg. He's all lame and not cooking meth like a loser. Nothing like cool and based Giga Chad Heisenberg. This version of Walt is best described as a bumbling idiot. Uh... He embarrasses himself in just about every episode for the first half of season three and even tries to sexually harass his boss. Do you think maybe I should call Skylar? Uh... Well, hey! It's only when Gus appeals to his insecurities about being unable to provide for his family that he's lured back into the lifestyle. A man provides for his family. And he does it even when he's not appreciated. This is probably the only time you'd ever see a character go back to cooking meth and become more likable for it. So if we accept the notion that the version of Walter we see at the beginning of season three is by no means Heisenberg, then that means none of the moments before that can be looked upon as the completion of the transformation. Which is funny because season two actually has the most moments of any season that people claim cements Walt's transformation into Heisenberg. Stay out of my territory. From asserting dominance over rival dealers, to letting Jane die right in front of him, to whatever the fuck he was trying to do in this scene. 
And yet, even during his absolute worst moments of season 2, you can still see a sense of morality fighting inside him. So, if the transformation isn't complete at any point before season 3, then when is it? Narrowing down this long and rich section of the show to just one moment where Walter permanently changes is not easy. But after looking extensively, I think the one moment that fits the bill better than any other is this moment right here that comes at the end of season four, episode 11, Crawl Space. In this moment, we see Walter more desperate than ever before. Jesse has turned against him. <coughs> Gus has fired him and threatened his family. I will kill. I will kill your son. I will kill your infant daughter. And now Gus's men are planning to kill Hank, as he's right on the verge of figuring out Gus's secret identity. Walt tips off the DEA that Hank is in danger in an effort to save his life, and forms a plan to take his family to flee before it's too late. I, I need to collect my wife and kids. Okay, just give me an hour, and then you make the phone call. But realizes, to his complete and utter horror, that there isn't enough money left to pay off the man who would have smuggled them away. Where's the rest? The money, Skyler, where is the rest? Skyler, where is the money? This means they can't flee, but it's also too late to stay since Walt has already tipped off the DEA, making him a dead man the second Gus figures out what he's done. For a moment, Walt truly believes his entire family is going to die because of his actions, and he loses his mind. <laughs> In some of the best acting I've ever seen on television, we see something in Walter die at this moment. In a Sopranos-esque fashion, we cut to black abruptly. In the next episode, End Times, we see a desperate Walter formulate a new plan. This is the first plan Walter enacts that most viewers will agree is evil. Walt slips some poisonous berries into Brock's lunch, sending him to the hospital. He then manipulates Jesse into thinking that Gus is the one who poisoned Brock. And as he intended, Jesse turns against Gus. And with the aid of Jesse's insider information, Walt is able to pinpoint a location where Gus is vulnerable, and he strikes. <laughs> Everything about his plan is clockwork. It is genius, but in the most evil way possible. It's calculated, cold, uncaring, and efficient. And whilst Brock does survive the ordeal, a fact that Walt is eager to point out later in the show, He's alive, isn't he? He's fine, just as I planned it. Don't you think I knew exactly how much to give him? Without an extensive knowledge of Brock's prior health and potential allergies, he had no way of knowing for sure that this would be the case. If his body had reacted just slightly more adversely to the poison, he would have died then and there and Walt was willing to take that risk. And that's not even accounting for the emotional turmoil that Brock, Andrea, and Jesse were put through. Heisenberg is where Walter's intellect meets his ruthlessness. And up to this point, he had only emerged when Walter's life was threatened. Please, please let me talk to him. Shut up. You might want to hold off. Why? Because your boss is gonna need me. He only ever appeared briefly because the moral side of Walter White tried to suppress him from taking total control. But after this point, something seems to change. From here on out until the end of the show, Walter seems different. It's like Heisenberg is switched on permanently. Walt makes cold and calculated decisions even when it's borderline unnecessary, such as having 10 men killed in prison to protect his identity. And it all leads back to this moment in Crawl Space. If it's true that prior to this moment, Heisenberg only emerged when Walter felt that his life was threatened, then what would happen if Walter thought there was no way out whatsoever? What would the defensive Heisenberg part of Walter's psyche do then? It would open the door for Heisenberg. Think about what we actually see happen in this scene. We see Walter seemingly lose his mind at this moment, laughing uncontrollably, and then we see him go still. What we are seeing here is the moment that Walter White ceases to exist. It's no coincidence that the crawl space itself resembles a tomb. This is Walter White's coffin. Once the old Walter is gone, there's nothing left to prevent Heisenberg from finally escaping Walt's subconscious and taking total control of his conscious mind. And that's exactly what happens. You couldn't point to a better moment than this one if you wanted to identify the scene where Heisenberg finally takes control for good. And that's why this is the moment that Walter becomes Heisenberg. The end. Or at least it would be the end if not for one small little hanging chad. That being the fact that I have been gaslighting you this entire time. Um, uh, no hard feelings.
That's right. I've been lying to you all. And you know what? You fell for it. Haha. <laughs> I'm a gaslighting, gatekeeping king. No joke, though. I actually was genuinely spewing bullshit that whole time. Uh, reading those last few sentences without cringing was difficult. So, why did I just gaslight the kind people of YouTube.com? Do I get some kind of sick kick from chicanery? Well, firstly, yes, but the main reason I did it is because I think that the online discourse surrounding Heisenberg is, well, a little dumb. I wanted to begin this video by playing along with the narrative that Heisenberg is just a flip that switches on and off in Walter's brain so that I could lure people in who already believe that and hopefully change their minds. Looking at Heisenberg as some kind of evil version of Walt that he becomes over the course of the show is a massive oversimplification of his character, and for that matter, his psychology. The fact of the matter is that Walter never becomes Heisenberg, because he was always Heisenberg. Earlier, when I was talking about the pilot, I said that he, quote, doesn't turn from a good man into a piece of shit in the first episode, unquote. And while that is true, my wording was intentionally a little deceptive. He doesn't transform from a good man into a piece of shit because he wasn't a good man to begin with. Well, 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 hold your horses, then Mr. Verdana. Are you actually trying to say that Breaking Bad, aka the show about change, isn't actually about change? Rest assured, I'm not trying to say that whatsoever. I mean, that would be a borderline impossible claim to justify. The pilot alone makes it crystal clear that one of the show's core themes is that of change. Namely, Walt's change. Chemistry is the study of matter, but I prefer to see it as the study of change. Well, that's... that's all of life. Growth, then decay, then transformation. My point of contention, rather, is with the manner of change that occurs within Walt. There is a shift in his character over the course of the show, but it doesn't concern his pride, his values, or even really his morals. All that really changes is how much he enjoys his work and how far he's willing to go to protect it. As the series goes on, he realizes more and more just how powerful it makes him feel to be a kingpin. Consequently, the deeper he gets himself into a life of crime, the less squeamish he is about getting his hands dirty. I would never try to argue that Walt doesn't become more comfortable with killing as the series goes because that much is extremely evident. Just look at his reaction, or lack thereof, to the death of Drew Sharp. But I would argue that the part of Walt that enabled him to not give a shit about a kid getting murdered was always a part of him. I think it's important to remember that Walt's stance on killing never really changes across the whole show. At every turn, he promises that there will be no more bloodshed, but he can never really bring himself to follow through on that. No matter what happens, no more bloodshed. We run our business our way and make sure that this never happens again. Now that we're in control, no one else gets hurt. You keep saying that and it's bullshit every time! Even at the very beginning of the show, when he's agonizing over having to kill Crazy 8, it's vital to keep in mind that he had already killed someone before that point in just as brutal of a fashion, and seemingly didn't lose much sleep over it. Walt, is that you? <gasps> Sure, it was a self-defense killing, but so was his killing of Crazy 8, since Crazy 8 would have targeted his family if let free. Dear Crazy 8, hey, listen, if I let you go, will you promise not to come back and waste my entire family? Nah, man, I can't say as I have high fucking hopes where that's concerned. The only difference when he had to kill Crazy 8 is that he had to do it with his own hands. He had to look into the eyes of the man he had to kill. And that's what he had a problem with. Or in other words, it wasn't some kind of inherent pacifism that made it difficult for Walter to kill Crazy 8, but rather the fact that he didn't have the stomach for it. Yet. And if you disagree, if you truly view Walt as a good man through and through in the pilot, I would just ask you, is he a good man through action or through inaction? Because I think you'll come to find the answer is the latter. He's not good per se. He just isn't a murderous kingpin yet. I just want to clarify that I don't believe anyone who thinks Walter White is a good man at the beginning of the show is stupid. That's actually one of the most common viewpoints people have about the show, and I absolutely understand why someone would think that. In fact, I can think of a great example of a particular person who thought initially that Walter White was a great guy, and that person 
is Vince Gilligan. This is the beauty of the collaborative medium of television. Left to my own devices when I wrote the pilot, I thought Walter White really was a great guy and he truly needed to do what he needed to do to leave money to his family. I didn't have much more than that. I really didn't. And I figured this good man, by virtue of the fact of, of immersing himself in this swamp of criminality, he would therefore become bad. What I came to realize, which I did not know at the beginning, is that it's like that old saying about Hollywood. Success in Hollywood, it's not so much that it changes you, but that it reveals your true self. In my opinion, that's what happened to Walter White. It revealed his true self. There was kind of a monster underneath it all. Vince originally thought that Walter White truly had a good heart underneath it all. But as he worked on the show and collaborated with other talented writers, he slowly realized that Walt was already a monster. And so, he began to lean into that outlook more and more when writing future seasons. There were elements, there was this this overweening pride and ego that you see pretty much from the, the, big, you know, the first season on, and it hides underneath that, I think, some sort of really terrible low self-esteem, some sort of shattered image of himself. The difference in Vince's intention for the show versus what he ended up writing is subtle but important. He always intended for Walter to become Scarface. And the pitch always was, uh, we're going to take Mr. Chips and we're going to turn him into Scarface. But initially the whole point is that he would become that bad person. The outlook of the writer shifted, meaning the show isn't about his transformation from a good man into a bad man, but rather the story of a bad man slowly revealing himself for who he truly is. And hey, that's not the only significant thing the writers changed their mind about. Fun fact, Jesse was originally supposed to die at the end of season one. They only kept him on because of how good Aaron Paul was, and it's because of that that we got to see the most wholesome friendship on TV. <laughs> Now, there are plenty of reasons to pity Walter White at the beginning of the show. He has it very rough. He's not taken seriously by his students, his friends, and even his family. He's overworked, underpaid, and unable to provide for his family properly, a fact which drives him mad. He even gets openly mocked by his 28-year-old high school students. Make those tires shine, huh? Oh my god. <laughs> Worst of all, he knows deep down that his life very easily could have gone a completely different way, as years ago he had unknowingly walked away from a business he co-founded which, had he stayed, would have made him a millionaire. The emasculation he feels combined with the regret he feels is enough to hollow him out on its own, but when his life gets turned upside down by a sudden lung cancer diagnosis giving him about a year to live, well... It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Doctor, my wife is seven months pregnant with a baby we didn't intend. I am an extremely overqualified high school chemistry teacher. I have watched all of my colleagues and friends surpass me in every way imaginable, and within 18 months, I will be dead. That being said, even though his situation is rough, from the get-go, Walt is driven by nothing but pride. Vince makes sure we won't miss this fact as an audience by presenting Walt with a potential way out of cooking meth in the fifth episode of the show. So you run the company with Elliot? Oh, no, uh, I, I gravitated toward education. Ah, what university? His old business partner, Elliot, offers him a dearly needed job at Grey Matter Industries, which is the multi-million dollar business Walt walked away from all those years ago. Are you asking me to come work for you at Grey Matter? You, you'd fit right in. You're brilliant. You, you, you got a ton of experience. But feeling insecure that Elliot is only offering him the job out of pity, Walt declines. So, all cards on the table, Elliot straight up offers to pay for Walt's entire cancer treatment. Now, if Walter truly has his family's best interests at heart, then there should be no reason for him to decline this offer. And yet, he does. What did you say? <sighs> Why? Walt. The only reason Walt does this is because, of course, he can't stand the sight of Elliot's humongous elephant ears. It's because he can't stand the idea of someone else giving him charity. And also because of Elliot's elephant ear, even if it means potentially bankrupting his own family, even if it means cooking crystal meth out in the middle of the desert and selling it to a homicidal maniac, he has to be the one who provides for his family, no matter what. Why? 
Well, that's a whole can of worms, and it all starts with his insecurity. Now, we all know that Walter White is a deeply insecure man. Walter. The knowledge that he sold his Grey Matter shares for a measly $5,000 is a constant source of shame for him. He feels like he failed not only himself, but also his children. Care to guess what that company is worth now? Millions. Billions. With a B. I sold my kid's birthright for a few months' rent. However, this shame alone cannot explain why he is completely unwilling to ever accept any form of help, even when it's to his own detriment, or even the detriment of those he claims to be serving, his children. You are not to spend a single dime of your own money. If there are taxes or lawyer's fees owed, you will take it right from here. They use my money, never yours. There's clearly something deeper going on here. The true source of the majority of Walt's insecurity is his own fragile sense of masculinity. Now, Walt feels emasculated at the beginning of the show, in some ways subtle, and in some ways not so subtle. What is going on down there? Yes. Is he asleep? Time and time again, we see that the single thing Walt hates the most is when people question his masculinity. No, no, it's, it's just heavy. That's why they hire men. <laughs> Looks like Keith Richards with a glass of warm milk. <laughs> this includes any and all forms of charity, which he sees as something only pathetic, emasculated people would require. He worked so hard on it. Just let him help. Skyler, it's charity. Why do you say that like it's some sort of dirty word? Cyber begging. That's all that is. Rattling a little tin cup to the entire world. Yeah, there's no deep-seated issues there. Vince makes this clear again by showing that the only thing capable of bringing Walt back into the meth business after he had previously vowed to quit is when Gus questions his masculinity and his ability to provide for his own family. What does a man do, Walter? A man provides for his family. He simply bears up and he does it because he's a man. Walt has very strict notions of what makes a man, a man. And as he learns the hard way, not living by these notions, as arbitrary and self-destructive as they may be at times, will make him feel insufficient as a man. You know, Walt strikes me as the kind of guy who probably would have liked Nietzsche. They have a lot in common, they're both kind of losers, and they're both beloved by Nazis. Nietzsche believed that modern civilization is like poison for the mind. He argued that it is up to the individual to first define their best possible self, aka the Ubermensch version of themselves, and then to dedicate their lives to becoming it. Nietzsche's Ubermensch carves out their own path in life, rather than doing what they're told even if fulfilling your own goals in life may inadvertently hurt other people. He believes collateral damage may be necessary on the path to greatness. Sound familiar? Walt sees in his head an image of what he believes to be his best self, his Ubermensch, and the path to becoming this version of himself gives his life meaning once again after years of an empty existence. The reason he feels that he has to do everything himself and assert his power over those around him is that he wants to prove to not only the world, but himself, that he's better now. He's strong now. He is Ubermensch. He fears that, should he fail to accomplish this, all the fears and anxieties that once governed his life will come flooding back. In other words, he essentially uses a facade of masculinity as a coping mechanism. Of course, that's not to suggest that providing for your family isn't in itself a noble goal. The issue is that Walt's true goal isn't actually to provide for his family, even though that's what he claims. To be fair, I'm certain that Walt believes his own lie, that he does what he does for his family, but that makes it no less of a lie. A lie that he uses as justification for a desperate bid to reclaim the power he saw as having been taken from him by an uncaring world. This never-ending fight to establish oneself as being Ubermensch is what Nietzsche referred to as the will to power, and I think it perfectly describes what Heisenberg represents in Walt. A lot of you watching this might think everything I'm saying is self-evident to anyone who is paying attention to the show, but the thing is, apparently a lot of people weren't paying attention, judging by the amount of people who seem to think that Walt's motivation is selfless, as if all he wanted to do was leave money for his family. By season four, Walter had already earned enough money to set his children up for life, and yet he keeps going. Why? Because he likes it. 
You need to understand. If I have to hear one more time that you did this for the family. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. I was... I was alive. So if I'm indeed correct in my bold assertion that Walt is fueled by his own ego, not love for his family, then you'd have to accept that, well, there is little to no change in Walter's true personality throughout Breaking Bad. Heisenberg isn't an alter ego that slowly corrupts him, but rather an integral part of Walter's personality that was always there. And I do mean always there. A key scene from season two sees Walt having lunch with Gretchen, his former girlfriend and co-founder of Grey Matter. Gretchen had just found out that Walt has been lying to his family, telling them that he had taken money from her and Elliot to pay for his cancer treatment. In truth, he was actually paying for it by acting on a Fox sitcom called Malcolm in the Middle, but unfortunately the pay wasn't very good, so he also had to sling a little meth on the side. Understandably, Gretchen is very confused, but Walter won't tell her anything. Walt, the look on Skyler's face, she's sitting there, tears in her eyes, thanking me for saving your life. Why would you do that to her? As I said, I will explain the whole thing to them. And while you're at it, explain it to me. I don't owe you an explanation. I owe you an apology, and I have apologized. I am very sorry, Gretchen. He apologizes, but only hesitantly. A good indicator of how uncomfortable he is even saying sorry to someone is that he counts out loud each time he utters the word. I've apologized twice now. I'm humbly sorry three times. But she continues to press him, which increasingly angers him. You involve us in your lie, and you sit here and tell me that that is none of my business. Yeah, that's pretty much the size of it. It's here that she asks this. What happened to you? Because this isn't you. Like many who watch the show, Gretchen is under the impression that Walt has changed for the worse. But as he is eager for her to know, he has not. What would you know about me, Gretchen? I think this is one of the few times in Breaking Bad that Walt is honest about himself. He knows deep down that he hasn't changed. He just feels more comfortable dropping the facade than he once did. This triggers a rant about the idea of taking charity, again enforcing that deep-rooted insecurity he has. That I should go begging for your charity, and you waving your checkbook around is going to make me forget how you and Elliot, how you and Elliot cut me out. What? And then we get to one of the most important pieces of information this scene has to offer. Now, Walt's life prior to the show remains pretty mysterious. We do get glimpses of it every now and again, including the scene when he and Skylar bought the house. We see in this scene that Walt was once full of ambition, thinking of this purchase as a mere starter house. How many bedrooms? Three. Told you. I think we're gonna need at least five, don't you think? Five? Yeah. Why buy a starter house when we'll have to move out in a year or two? Why be cautious? We've got nowhere to go but up. Of course, his life didn't work out that way, but perhaps some of that old ambition bubbles up within him again during the duration of the show. As interesting as the scene is, it's just a mere snapshot of a moment within a much larger life. Prior to this episode, it remained a mystery why Walt left Grey Matter. Something happened between the three of us, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but for personal reasons, I decided to leave the company. But in this scene, we get as close to an answer as the show ever gives us. Walt accuses Gretchen of cutting him out of the company, but according to Gretchen, he left of his own accord. You left me for the July weekend, you and my father and my brothers, and I go up to our room and you're packing your bags, barely talking. What, 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 what did I dream? All that? So, what did happen between Walt, Gretchen, and Elliot, and why did he leave Grey Matter? Well, the answer does lie within the text, but it's very subtle. And I mean subtle enough that you have to analyze each line of dialogue with a microscope to see it. And I thought about doing that, but that's really hard, so instead I just googled what Vince Gilligan said about it, and according to him, Walt decided to leave Gretchen when he found out her family was extremely wealthy. This caused him to feel insufficient as a partner, as he wouldn't be providing for her, but rather vice versa. As we've already seen, this is one of Walt's major pressure points. As petty as it may have been, he would rather have left her, and by extension his own company, than feel inferior to her. You walked away, you, you a 
abandoned us, me. This explains a lot. It explains why he left her the day he was supposed to meet her family. It provides further context as to why he called her a rich girl. Rich girl, just adding to your millions. And it explains why he is so resentful of her and Grey Matter. He didn't just lose out on millions of dollars by leaving. He also feels as if she emasculated him. And because of that, he hates her. Even though, let's be honest, she did nothing wrong. Fuck you. I think deep down Walter knows that his reason for leaving Grey Matter was stupid, so in classic Walt fashion, he convinces himself of a lie that Gretchen and Elliot sabotaged him. Little did I understand that they were artfully maneuvering me into leaving my own creation. This scene lets us know a lot not only about Walter's backstory, but also him as a character. He didn't just become Heisenberg when he started cooking meth. He was already Heisenberg long before that. Now, let's address the ultra-high IQ argument I presented earlier for how Walt transitions into Heisenberg at the end of Crawl Space, which I based on similar arguments I've seen online. It can be easily deconstructed and disproven. Now, I know this isn't an accurate representation of every online argument about the Walt-Heisenberg dichotomy. This is just an example of one argument out of hundreds I could have used for the sake of this video. So, with that being said, Let's do a little debunking. The assumption that this whole argument hinges upon is that Heisenberg is an alter ego of Walt which lies dormant within his subconscious. I also claimed that prior to this episode, Heisenberg only emerged when Walt was in danger as a defense mechanism. I further claimed that Walt and his family were in more danger than ever before in this scene. Or at least that's what Walter thought at the time. The final assumption of my argument was that Walt is different after this point in the show, as if the sense of morality that once held him back finally evaporated. The conclusion I drew from these four preconditions was that Walt, owing to the fact that he thought in this moment he had no way out, finally allowed his Heisenberg alter ego to take permanent control of his conscious mind, finalizing his transition into the warped man we follow for the final stretch of the show. While this may sound like a somewhat convincing argument on paper, it just isn't. Let's go through each precondition and debunk it. Firstly, as I already mentioned, the claim that Heisenberg is an alter ego of Walt, a popular theory online, seems to be at odds with what we actually see in the show. Of all the ideas I facetiously put forward in my argument, the idea that Heisenberg is some kind of self-defense mechanism of Walter is easily the most stupid. It's just so stupid. Like, as if Walter didn't ever start acting like Heisenberg at moments when his life clearly wasn't being threatened. How do you explain the pool scene? We're celebrating. Huh. Was Walt at risk of being murdered by Hank here and the only way to defend himself was intoxicating his son? My son! My bottle! My house! No, what he actually wanted was to establish himself as the dominant male figure in his son's life, even if that meant directly harming his son's well-being. <laughs> even the example I gave of Heisenberg blowing up Tuco's office isn't an example of some kind of dark psyche taking over Walt, since this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision, but rather a plan he'd have been cooking up for a while. What, was Heisenberg in control for the entire span of time it would have taken to cook the mercury fulminate needed to enact the plan? If you still want to argue that yes, Heisenberg was in control for that entire time, then you'd essentially be conceding that Heisenberg does emerge at times that Walt's life isn't threatened, and thus isn't a defense mechanism. Some people point to this scene from season 3 when Walter is about to crash into a truck, but he swears away at the last moment. According to them, this is Walt trying to kill himself, and Heisenberg forcibly taking over to prevent his death. Now, to the people who unironically argue this, I have a proposition for you. I would say, uh, try it for yourself. Just get in your car, drive out onto the road, and then swerve into the wrong lane, and wait for death to approach. If, in the moments before you collide with another vehicle and end your life, you suddenly feel a compulsion to swerve out of the way and uh, save yourself, then, my friend, 
there's an evil Heisenberg living within you, trying to keep you alive so that you can poison a child. Okay, let's move on. Equally ridiculous is my implication that when Heisenberg isn't in control, Walter tries to suppress him. Heisenberg wasn't an alter ego of Walt that he tried to suppress. Heisenberg was what he wanted to be. A guy opens his door and gets shot and you think that of me? No, I am the one who knocks. Even just saying Heisenberg was in control is cringe as fuck, man. He was never in control. Walt was always in control. There is no Heisenberg. So I think I can safely declare the first two preconditions of this argument to be thoroughly unconvincing. The next precondition of this argument is that Walt and his family are in more danger than they've ever been in before when Walt's meltdown occurs. And yeah, that certainly seems to be true. It's not a claim I can debate, so this one's true. But trust me, it's the only one. The final precondition of this argument is that Walt is different after this point, the last shreds of his morality gone forever. Whilst it's true that Walt makes increasingly immoral and reckless decisions the further one ventures into the show, rendering season 5 as his worst season in that regard, that doesn't mean that there's some kind of sudden shift that occurs after the crawl space meltdown. Poisoning Brock, whilst being the worst act Walt had committed yet, isn't some kind of Anakin Skywalker style turn towards the dark side, but rather the culmination of a gradual process. Process. Walt's ability to rationalize committing terrible acts is one of his superpowers. He could lie to anyone, including himself, better than anyone alive. There's some sort of collision radar on the jet that may not have been working properly. And, and the whole system is run on, on 1960s technology. Not really. I blame the government. This is a guy who deludes himself at every turn about why he does the things he does, about who he is and, and what kind of morality and goodness he possesses. This is a man who still thinks of himself as a good provider and a good man. He is truly skilled at convincing those around him, and for that matter, himself, that what he does needs to be done. If you believe that there's a hell, we're already pretty much going there, right? But I'm not going to lie down until I get there. As the show progresses, his talent for rationalization grows stronger and stronger until he's able to convince himself that killing 10 men just to protect himself is morally permissible. If it's supposedly true that Walt loses the last shreds of his humanity in that crawl space, then why is it that in the very next scene with him, we see him acting somewhat noble for a change? You said we're in danger. Yes, because of me. No, it doesn't matter now. All that matters no, is- All that matters is that the rest of you are safe. And that's why I'm not going with you. How long till you're safe? Oh, Skylar, I've made choices. Listen I... to me, I alone should suffer the consequences of those choices, no one else. No more prolonging the inevitable. Furthermore, despite however evil Walt may seem in the show's final season, he never loses all of his humanity. And this is best exemplified in the moment he fights desperately to save Hank's life. Just no scenario where this guy lives. No, 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 listen! I have money! I have money! It's buried out here. Eighty million. And all you've got to do is let him go. So that means we can scratch off the final precondition, leaving only one of four. All in all, it's a little hard to justify the claim that Walt dies in the crawl space and is replaced with Heisenberg for the rest of the series, when three out of the four preconditions for that argument aren't met. Of course, there exist many other arguments for moments Walt becomes Heisenberg, but they all suffer from the same problems. A lot of people online do admit that the process of Walt's devolution is gradual, and that there is no one moment that he becomes Heisenberg, but I think a lot of them still make the mistake of assuming that Heisenberg is other than Walt in the first place, because he isn't. Even analyses of Breaking Bad that I like hold on to the idea that Walt is separate from Heisenberg. You can see his two sides battling inside him. Walter White would save her, but Heisenberg would let her go, as she's nothing but a burden. Whether you believe that Walt's transformation is gradual or not, I think you're missing the point of the show if you assume that the monster wasn't within him from the start. Breaking Bad serves as a warning to its audience not to allow your ego and pride to consume you, because deep down, everybody possesses at least a few Machiavellian traits. The choice you have is whether to act on them or not. Walt found himself placed into an environment where the darkest branches of his personality could blossom, and so he made the mistake of allowing them to. While some people overlook these red flags in Walt's persona, others see them, but choose to embrace them. 
So we've covered the idea that Heisenberg is some kind of alter ego of Walt, and in turn, I've made an effort to debunk that claim. Because it's wrong, but there's another significant faction of people I must now turn my attention towards. They, like the people we've already covered, believe that there is a fundamental difference between Walter White and Heisenberg but for starkly different reasons. Increasingly, there is a large subset of people who view Heisenberg as a champion of masculinity and being based. I'm a lesbian. I'm gay. I am the one who knocks. He commonly appears alongside the likes of Patrick Bateman, Homelander, and the Joker in TikToks made by 13-year-old boys who like Andrew Tate. Viewing Heisenberg in this light reframes the entire show. To them, Heisenberg isn't Walt's undoing, but rather, his salvation, which makes his character arc less of a tragedy and more of a triumph. I must admit, I see this way of thinking as being about as far from correct as possible, but for the sake of examining every side of the argument, I'll bite. In fact, I'm gonna go watch some content about how Walter White is a Sigma male. BRB. Alright. After consuming a bunch of this content, I think I can safely say that I was wrong all along. That's right, I've opened up my third eye, guys, and now I understand the truth behind Vince's arguments. Through this show, he was trying to warn us about what happens when you eat veggie bacon and let women boss you around. You will become lame. Guys, you have to understand that at the beginning of the show, Walter is a sheeple. His dick no get hard and he gets made fun of by his brother-in-law. Well, they aren't laughing for long once he becomes based and epically starts cooking meth like a boss. I finally get it. Not only are Walter White and Heisenberg actually different, but it turns out they're polar opposites, two sides of a spectrum. Walt represents the blue pill, aka being unepic, and Heisenberg represents the true red pill sigma energy vibrations. In fact, Heisenberg is meant to symbolize the subconscious alpha male living inside us all, and all we have to do to unleash it on the world is to escape the Matrix. Never mind that becoming Heisenberg completely ruined Walt's life and made his entire family hate him. In fact, just discount the last few episodes of the show entirely and ignore everything Walt says in admittance of his own mistakes. He was the danger, and he sure puts stupid Skylar in her place. Ha <laughs> Dumb bitch trying to keep her kids safe. Walt was never abusive towards Jesse. They were BFFs. I just gave you $600. Thanks, daddy. (laughs) Haha, okay. I've had my fun. Look, people are entitled to interpret media any way they choose. I can even understand why someone might root for Walter White within the confines of the story. Say goodnight. He starts the series as an underdog, and in many cases, such as in his battle against Gus, he's the lesser of two evils. But there's a difference between passively enjoying him as a character, and viewing him as a role model in real life. And that's only the beginning of the problem here. I mean, even if all it takes for you to look up to someone is for them to wear a fedora and poison children, Walt destroys himself through his own actions just as much as he destroys everyone around him. I'm struggling to see how anyone could even interpret the show as anything else than a direct condemnation of what Walt becomes. We've come to realize who this guy is in a way that I didn't I didn't know who he was like I do now, you know, in the early going. But but Walter White ultimately is a very prideful man. He's very immoral at this point in the in the show here in season four. I mean, I don't know what I'm expecting here. We are dealing with the same group of people who repeatedly sent Anna Gunn, the actress for Skylar, death threats because they didn't like her character. But even still Come on, guys. Sometimes I feel like you gotta be trolling. I mean, I watched a guy sit down and react to a video that is clearly satire making fun of Heisenberg simps, and he managed to not realize it for the entire duration of the video. Walter wasn't a bad guy. He just became based. To illustrate the importance of power in a father figure, let's look at the Oedipus Complex by Sigmund Freud. But they they don't want you to break bad like Walter White because they see that you'll get power. So according to Fraud, it is extremely important to have a powerful father figure to shape one's superego. And Walt's journey is all about taking the Pretty power much. and there's nothing wrong with liking what you're good at. Frankly, it's the American dream. Exactly. Waltering, people think of Walter as a good guy in the first episode, but he's only- I mean, how do you 
how do you reach this level of blind dedication to Daddy Walt? Well, let me try to answer that question. The first time I ever watched Breaking Bad, I was like 14, and if I'm being honest, a large part of me sided with Walt. In fact, I still liked Walt a lot later than I probably should have. I know that there is a certain drug to Walt's rise to power because I felt it. The show walks a fine line between encouraging its audience to understand Walt and encouraging the audience to hate him. It's true that near the beginning, the shift towards Heisenberg seems to bring positive connotations for Walt. Badass dad. In the pilot, we see a man who has no confidence, he can barely make eye contact, and he has a terrible effeminate mustache. I called it an impotent mustache. If a mustache drops below the creases of the, of the lips, no, that gets badass. So you have to make sure that's always above the crease of the lips, and you thin it out so you can see skin underneath it, and it doesn't look as masculine. It just seems, what's the point? That is all intentional, but it's not there to convey that he's some kind of weak beta male for not cooking meth yet. It's there to convey that he's depressed and has no real direction in his life. Look at that. That is veggie bacon. Zero cholesterol and you won't even taste the difference. You're an insane, degenerate piece of filth and you deserve to die. But he rapidly undergoes change, and with this change comes a boost in his morale. Each stage of his evolution is represented metaphorically by his chemistry lessons. Explosions. Explosions are the result of chemical reactions happening almost instantaneously. The faster they undergo change, the more violent the explosion. So yes, I would never try to deny that initially becoming Heisenberg gives Walt a boost. Is that you? He latches on to purpose after being diagnosed with cancer, which temporarily cures this depression and gives him purpose, hence him finally having the confidence to grow some half-decent facial hair, but emphasis on the word temporarily. The lifestyle Walt chooses is just as much of a high as you'd get from consuming his product. It's not a real solution to his problem. If anything, it creates more problems than it solves. I can admit that something about watching someone as boomerish as Walt become a badass is very enthralling. Hey, look, I'm just the chemist here. I'm not the street guy, yo. But the mistake people make is to allow these feelings to impair their judgment of actual morality. The best example of that I can think of is the widespread hatred of Skylar White. Now, there may be other factors in why so many people dislike Skylar. Who am I kidding? There definitely are other factors. The biggest thing that upset me about Skylar was her hypocrisy. That's because a lot of women, not all but a lot of them, are that way in real life. But a large one has to do with the role she plays in the story as a hindrance for Walt. There's nothing you can say that'll convince me there won't come a day that somebody will knock on that door looking to harm you or me or all of us. And when that day comes, the children cannot be here. If you don't like Skylar White because you see her as a stick-in-the-mud character who makes it harder for Walt to do cool stuff that you as a viewer want to see, like pulling off a train heist, then sure. My name is Skylar White, yo. My husband is Walter White, yo. However, if you try to objectively say that Skylar is a worse person than Walt because she slept with Ted Beneke, I fucked Ted. After Walt refused to grant her a divorce? I won't tell Hank, and I won't tell your children if you grant me this divorce and stay out of our lives. Oh, Scott. I mean it. Then you've allowed your judgment to be impaired. Either that or your moral compass has some serious problems. And no matter where you go online, there is widespread vitriol directed against her. I loathe her. I literally had to fast forward scenes with her and watch the others. Her narcissism and lack of gratitude and Skylar is the reason money, why I can't watch reruns of the show. And still if only like she had been killed victim, and killed gruesomely, I can't fucking stand her. Walt's a dick at times, but he's doing his best. Skylar was just a bitchy wife. Walt deserved better. She, she was controlling and, and manipulative before she knew anything involved. about the method. Only sensible man babies like Skylar. He poisoned one kid for a good cause. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! 
Just to jog your memory, Walt's greatest hits throughout Breaking Bad include letting Jesse's girlfriend choke to death in front of him, sending Jesse to kill Gale, poisoning a child to get what he wanted, watching another child get shot and then doing nothing about it, killing Mike for no reason, working with a neo-Nazi gang to have 10 men slain in prison just to protect his identity, putting a hit on Jesse, and of course, refusing to go go-karting with Jesse. You wanna do something? Go-karts? Go-karts. No. Oh yeah, and also selling him into meth slavery. That wasn't very nice either. There are scores of people who watched all of this transpire and believe, unironically, that Walter does nothing wrong throughout the course of the show. And on top of that, that his family is worse than he is. His son calls him names. See the disrespect he gets for, for being, this is, this is what happens when you're a good man. No matter what Walt does, no matter how poorly his own actions blow up in his face, they will always claim it was someone else's fault. For example, they commonly say that Jane's death was her own fault, a result of her own heroin overdose, and that by simply letting her die, as she would have anyways, he was actually saving Jesse from overdosing with her at some point in the future. It dawns on him that by saving her, he is dooming Jesse. I honestly believe that virtually any good person in Walt's position would in the circumstances act the same way. To make this argument, you have to ignore the facts that, one, Walter didn't do this for Jesse's well-being, but his own. Not only had Jane just blackmailed him. This is blackmail. What I know about you, high school teacher turned drug dealer with a brother-in-law in the DEA. That'd make one hell of a story. National news, I'll bet. And ambiguously threatened that she might leak his identity to the police. How do I know she'll keep quiet? I guess you don't. But it was only because of Jane that Walt was about to lose his partner in Jesse. You'll never hear from either of us again. You are making a mistake. If Jane was taken out of the equation, Jesse would stick around, which is what he wanted. Two, if Walt was truly concerned about Jesse's drug problem, he could have just called the police and had them both put into rehab instead of just watching Jane die. And even if you want to argue that that would be risky, that there's a chance that they would give up his identity as Heisenberg in rehab, assuming anyone would even believe them. If you're trying to make a moral argument about what Walt should have done in this scenario, you can't argue that letting her die was the better choice. Even Walter knew it was wrong and you can plainly see it in his face. Three, letting Jane die irreparably destroyed Jesse's mental well-being for the rest of the series. Hey, if you're trying to sell me something, I've got four little words for you. Do not call list. However, if you're cool, leave it at the beep. And four, Walter was the one who knocked her onto her back in the first place, which is what caused her to choke, meaning she wouldn't have choked at all if not for him showing up. So he didn't just watch her die, he more so inadvertently murdered her. This is far from being the only argument of this caliber I commonly see online. They say that the fallout with Gail and later Gus was Jesse's fault, while ignoring the fact that the only reason Walt's partnership with Gail didn't work out is because Walt's ego was so big he couldn't stand working with someone else who was almost as smart as him. I can't believe this. This is my replacement. Oh, Jesus! I'm sorry, I must be missing something. I don't mean I don't mean to be. Oh! This. No! Makes no sense. They say that Hank's death was his own fault for trying to arrest Walt, even though Walt was the one who summoned the men that killed him. And pretty much everything else was Skylar's fault, of course. Mills. The truth that is right in front of us is that everything Walt does as Heisenberg is driven not by strength or resolve but by insecurity and ego. This fact apparently does not phase a large portion of society because there are a lot of people out there who idolize toxic traits. It is disheartening to see Breaking Bad so commonly misinterpreted as some kind of red-pilled show about the power of masculinity in the same way that shows such as The Boys and films such as American Psycho are. Walter White, Homelander, and Patrick Bateman are not supposed to be characters you would ever want to look up to. Uh-uh. Half now. Half later. But apparently a large portion of the public are so starved for characters they view as being Sigma that they'll latch onto them anyways. In my opinion, he especially appeals to people who feel that they haven't reaped the rewards they are holding life. 
They want to punch back at the world and watching more to it appeals to their fantasies. Exactly why that is the case is a topic for an entirely different video about the role masculinity plays in culture and how young people, specifically young men, in the world today feel starved for it to the point that they'll attach themselves to characters that are deranged murderous perverts. Oh, and on the topic of debauchery, let's just acknowledge certain things about Walter White that almost never get talked about online, such as that one scene from season two. You know, the one where he assaults Skylar. Oh, and by the way, if this isn't the kind of thing you want to see, just skip forward to this time. This scene comes shortly after Walt had started calling himself Heisenberg, and immediately after he had just witnessed Tuco beating another man to death. Wow! Oh! Damn, man, look at that, look! You can tell his adrenaline levels are still high from what he'd just seen. Didn't you hear me? Walt. And more specifically, that he still feels the rush that being Heisenberg had given him. So, how does he cope with these feelings? By attempting to force himself on his wife. Walter Jr. is going to be home any minute, so... Okay, um, enough. Hold up! Stop it! Stop it! No matter how you want to frame it, there really is no justification or excuse for that. And again, it's almost never brought up when people discuss the show. Just ask yourself, if Breaking Bad is supposed to be a show about Walter White becoming a better version of himself, a la Nietzsche, then why is this scene here? Why would the writers put this here so shortly after Walt's first moments of quote-unquote being a badass? Answer, because this isn't a show about Walter White becoming a badass, it's a show about Walter White becoming an adrenaline junkie or maybe testosterone junkie would be more accurate. And even as early as the eighth episode of the show, the writers were trying to convey this, and frankly, a lot of people missed the glaring red flags. I can already tell that there will be a lot of angry people in the comments accusing me of being anti-masculinity or whatever, but please understand, I'm not trying to say that Breaking Bad is anti-masculinity. There's obviously nothing wrong with being masculine in itself. The problem is that what we're seeing here isn't masculinity. This is toxicity in its purest form. They are not the same thing. It only takes a quick search online to see that scores of psychologists who have watched and studied Breaking Bad have all diagnosed Walter White with narcissistic personality disorder. According to one such study, the definition of the disorder is as follows. The individual, one, has a grandiose sense of self-importance. Do you know what would happen if I suddenly decided to stop going into work? A business big enough that it could be listed on the NASDAQ goes belly up. It ceases to exist without me. Two is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. You asked me if I was in the meth business or the money business. Neither. I'm in the empire business. Three believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special and high status people. I was told that the man I would be meeting with is very careful cautious man. I believe we're alike in that way. Four requires excessive admiration. Say my name. Heisenberg. You're goddamn right. Five has a sense of entitlement. I just need my half of the money and I will go. There is no your half of the money. There is only my all of it. Do you understand? Six is interpersonally exploitative. Who do you know who's allowed children to be murdered? Gus! Seven, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others. What happened to that boy is a tragedy. What, do I have to curl up in a ball in tears in front of you? It's done! Eight, is often envious of others and believes that others are envious of him or her. Do you really believe that you mean anything to these people? This whole thing, all of this, it's all about me. Nine, shows arrogance, haughty behaviors, or attitudes. This guy, Gail Bedecker, he was a genius. Genius? Not so much. Looks like nothing more than just simple rote copying, probably of someone else's work. Walter White clearly exhibits all nine of these attributes, and he exhibits them almost off the bat. Climb down out of my ass. <laughs> As early as the pilot, we see that Walter White has trouble processing his feelings. You understood what I've just said to you? Yes. Lung cancer. Inoperable. It's just 
You've got mustard on your... Right there, you got mustard there. Right there? From his feeling of superiority to those around him, to his need to be appreciated, to his manipulation of those around him to achieve his own ends. Why him? Because he does what I say. Walter White isn't masculine, he's a narcissist, and the fact that the two are so easily conflated by modern audiences is a telltale sign of a larger problem. Now, despite everything I've said, it is true that Walter White never loses 100% of his humanity. He never becomes pure evil. That's the nature of a tragedy. You don't have to like Macbeth. You can recognize that he's a power-hungry fuck, but you can still sympathize with him and see aspects of yourself in him. The same is true of Walter White. You killed Uncle Hank. You killed him. I can't all what, be for what nothing. You did? Just Please. shut up. Shut up. Please. And moreover, you always understand the motivation behind his actions. You don't have to agree with it, you probably shouldn't agree with it, but even so, the writers made sure to write an understandable motivation for him the whole way through. He always feels like a real person, and I think this is why so many people are willing to overlook the inhuman things he does. The drug of just how well written Walt's character is is so captivating that a lot of people fail to take a step back and critically think about him as a human being. Breaking Bad is, at its core, a tragedy in which the protagonist falls victim to his most glaring character flaw. In Walt's case, that flaw is ego. You can't blame anyone else for his downfall, no matter how hard you may try. Ultimately, Walter dies both figuratively and literally of self-inflicted wounds. And I think people separating Walter and Heisenberg into two different entities and, moreover, picking one single moment in which he permanently switches over from one to the other is a product of people wanting to oversimplify what is a very complex show. I think it's important to view a show like Breaking Bad in all of its complexity if you want to truly understand it. And I think this applies to all nuanced antagonists in media. It's all too common for media to take a certain type of person and to turn these characters into very two-dimensional cartoonish villains. And whilst I understand why someone might want to do that, if a culture portrays a certain type of person in a certain way for long enough, people will start to think that's how they actually are and will fail to recognize that type of person in real life should they encounter them. Hold on for a second now! While I understand sympathizing with mentally ill people who are routinely misrepresented by the media, why would you care about someone truly evil being dehumanized? Isn't it a good thing to be humanized, evil people? If you dehumanize evil in fiction, it will become harder to recognize in real life. Breaking Bad presents us with a narcissist who is realistic and, more importantly, humanized. And whilst the consequence of that is that some people will view him as some kind of hero, the rest of the viewers who understand what Vince was trying to say will more easily be able to recognize the red flags that they saw in Walter White in real life, whether it be in someone they know or even themselves. Heisenberg is an expression of Walt's narcissism. He and viewers at home thought the first time he used that name that it was merely to shield his identity from Tuco. But ironically, Heisenberg ended up being the most honest reflection of Walter's true self. In the end, all Walt wanted was to be awake. And through Heisenberg, he achieved that. He didn't truly change as a person throughout the show. And I can tell you right now what moment Walt became Heisenberg. The moment he was born. Of course, it might literally not have been the exact moment he was born. There's a whole nature versus nurture debate about what causes your personality to crystallize. And maybe it was how he was raised. Maybe it was something that happened during his childhood. I don't know. We don't really get much information about Walt's life before the show starts. But the point is that it happens before the show starts. That's just what I'm trying to say. So that's pretty much it. That's my take on the dichotomy between Walter White and Heisenberg. Breaking Bad may be one of my favorite shows, but the discourse surrounding it will likely continue to be garbage well into the future. I don't know if it's my own fault for expecting the internet to not be terrible. It probably is. But don't expect the this is the moment Walt becomes Heisenberg comments to go away anytime soon. Now, if you'll excuse me, this is the moment my video becomes over. <laughs> Well, that certainly was a mouthful, but it's done now. I hope it was as enjoyable an experience for you as it was for me. And you know what? I want to talk about more morally complex characters in the future. 
I'm looking at you, Tony Soprano. I'm sure many of you noticed that this was the first episode of Rewound that I have made for about a year and a half. And I'm also aware that there may be some confusion as to what separates an episode of Rewound from just a normal run-of-the-mill analysis video. And yes, the distinction has been somewhat blurry. I take full responsibility for that. I guess it just comes down to me never having actually explained what the difference is, but essentially a Rewind video will just delve far deeper into any given topic than just a normal analysis video will. And one of the most telltale signs that differentiates Rewound from other videos is the length. As you may have noticed, Rewound videos are a lot longer than the average analysis videos, so hopefully you're into that. That's not to be confused with the ranked videos, which have also gotten very analytical and also very long. I know that those three types of videos are all kind of blurring together, but I'm gonna make an effort to try to make the distinction more clear going forward. You can expect to see more rewound, more rankings, and more shorter analysis videos in the future. So hopefully that clears that up. Thank you.